Welcome to the People's Movement, a production of the Prince George's County Council, empowering the people of Prince George's County with information, transformation, and progress. Time now for the People's Movement with your host, Council Chair Calvin Hawkins. Hello, I am Calvin Hawkins. I serve as chair of the Prince George's County Council. Thank you for joining us today on the People's Movement. This is our first episode, and we are grateful that you're tuning in. I'm also excited to have an opportunity to talk about mental health issues in Prince George's County. And I also wanna thank the Prince George's County Council because this is a production of of the Prince George's County Council. And I would like to thank them for this opportunity. I also wanna thank our guests today. We have two, but we will start with Deneen Richmond, Prince George's County own. She is the chair, she is the CEO of Luminous Health. And Deneen, thank you for joining us today Tell us about this new mental health facility that Luminous is building in partnership with the Prince George's County government. Tell us about your vision. Tell us a little bit about you. And let's talk about this facility that you all are building. Absolutely. And thank you, Chair Hawkins, for having me as your guest today. I am honored and thrilled to be here. So as you mentioned, I'm Deneen Richmond. I'm the president of Luminous Health Doctors Community Medical Center, and I've been in that role since October. However, I am not new to the county. I am a lifelong Prince Georgian, a proud graduate of Eleanor Roosevelt High School in the Science and Technology Program. Go Raiders, got a shout out for them. And, And just honored to finally have an opportunity to give back to the community and the county who has made me who I am. So the other thing that I'm very, very excited about is the opportunity that Doctors has to begin to offer behavioral health services on our Lanham campus very, very soon. We are in the process right now of renovating a 31,000 square foot building that used to serve as a nursing home some years ago but that entire facility is going to be devoted to offering behavior healthcare services with an array of ambulatory services on the first floor. And we are with the state's permission, planning to open a 16 bed inpatient unit on the second floor. So it's going to be able to meet some very important needs and unmet needs that our county residents have today. Deneen, tell us, where are we in the process with completing the uh, mental health facility and how are we looking at this point? Sure. So we are, so I mentioned that it's an existing building, but with the exception of the four outer walls, everything else has been demolished and we are rebuilding it into a state-of-the-art facility designed specifically for providing mental health care. So at this point in time, the work is going full steam ahead on the first floor where we're gonna open and hopefully by the end of this year, there's a possibility that there might be a slight delay to that. I think everyone is aware that, you know, there's so many impacts from this pandemic and we are in the process right now of figuring out whether or not construction delays because of supplies and material and laborers not being available might have a a small impact. But we will definitely have that ambulatory area open in the upcoming months. And then for the inpatient beds, which will be on the second floor, we have submitted back in April, in fact, we submitted a certificate of need, which is a required process that you have to go through here in the state of Maryland to the Maryland Healthcare Commission to get approval to open those bids. And that certificate of need is moving along nicely. And so we hope that with the state's process by December, hopefully of 2022, so about a year and a half from now, we would be in a position where we can open up those inpatient bids as well. Okay, as someone committed to health equity and as the CEO of Luminous Health, Tell me, what do you think about this as a native Prince Georgian? What does this mean to our county to have this facility? 
So I think it is so important. You know, mental health has been one of those areas that unfortunately has had a stigma associated with it, and it shouldn't. We know that one in 10 residents in Prince George's County actually are in need of behavioral health care services, whether that's mental health care or substance use disorder services. And just like we address everything that's going on with our physical bodies, we need to be able to address everything that's going on with our mental health as well. And in this pandemic, you know, we have seen an increase as people have had to deal with this pandemic over the last 15, 16 months of the need just being greater. Things like anxiety and depression and just people's coping skills have been challenged trying to get through this pandemic. So it is so important. And we know that right now those needs are not fully met. When we look across the, um, looking at the community health needs assessment and other reports and statistics, we know that currently in Prince George's County, we rank closer to the bottom across the state with the number of mental health providers per resident. We also know that almost half of the county residents who require inpatient mental health have to go outside of the county to find a bed. So our goal is to change that. We want people to be able to get quality care close to home, to be able to interact and have their families able to be a part of their care plan and not have access or transportation or other things serve as a barrier to people getting the care that they need. Thank you so very much, Denise, for being a guest with me today. I'm so grateful to the work you're doing, and we look forward to the outstanding work you will continue to do in the area of mental health. Have a fantastic day. Thank you, Chair Hawkins, and thanks for inviting me to join you today. This is the People's Movement, a production by the Prince George's County Council. I am grateful to have C.J. Blair. No one like C.J. Blair needs an introduction. What he's doing around our community in the DMV and across the country when it comes to youth and dealing with mental health issues. I'm, instead of me trying to explain this, I'm going to ask C.J. Blair to tell us a little bit about himself. C.J. also talk about how mental health impact our youth and talk about some of the work you're doing to make a difference in the lives of the young people that you deal with. Well, first and foremost, thank you, uh, Councilman, uh, for having me on this show. Uh, I'm honored and privileged to be here to speak on these issues concerning youth and young adults. Uh, again, like you said, I am C.J. Blair. Most people call me C.J. Blair Speaks because I talk a lot, obviously. But I talk about things that are impactful because I believe that words do shape worlds. So if we speak the right things, regardless of what we're saying, then we can ultimately see what it is that we said. So when it comes to our community with youth and uh, young adults, I was a young person that spent a lot of time going in and out of juvenile facilities, state facilities, onto federal situations, simply because of mental health. I say mental health because most of the stuff that is common in my community is very traumatic and very dysfunctional. So I decided that I wanted to uh, be more than my neighborhood, be more than my past experiences. But I'm a little scriptural, a little biblical, and I begin to believe in as a man thinks, so is that man. So as my thinking began to change, I thought I could be more than just an athlete, an entertainer, or a criminal when I thought I could be more impactful and, and more positive in our community, my, my walking began to line up with my talking. And here we are some 17 years later, almost 20 years later, and we're in communities all across the country. First, giving individuals permission to get their mental health checked out, to say, hey, man, a lot of this stuff that is dysfunctional or normal is really not normal. And because it's not normal, we've accepted and embraced it as a normality, which has been dysfunctional to our community. So I just wanted to break up some of that monotony of regular activity that was really killing our young people and causing them not to have good qualities of life. So I think they call me a youth culture advisor. And what that is, is I'm the guy that comes in and gives you permission to give up some of the false codes that you held on to 
that was ingrained in us as young people when we were young people being raised by young people because of 86, 87, 88 and the crack epidemic, it literally flipped the the foundation of the family where those that was supposed to be led by adults were now leading adults because it was the kids that was in control of the drugs. And it was those adults who were supposed to be our elders and our leaders that ultimately fell victim to addiction and the epidemic of crack cocaine. And what you're dealing with now some 30, 40 years later is the remnants of that where we see the lack of training, the lack of nurturing, the lack of even being able to talk with young people. And it's because of those things that we're seeing increases in murder rate, increases in in, in crime in those facilities. So I just wanted to be an individual to say, hey, I don't want to yell at nobody. I'm good for rallies. Uh, I'm, I'm good for church. I love the Lord and all those things. However, in this particular situation, we need to save ourselves. So we started with SOS. And from then, we've gone into the communities from everything from mental health to housing. I know that was a lot. I talk a lot. CJ, you are everywhere touching young people and trying to transform them in a positive way. How do you see mental health, this formal approach that we are taking how do you see that helping the young people as they de- deal with turning their lives around? Well, young people will benefit tremendously from mental health awareness, but actually mental health care. So what we do, we like to have direct care with youth and young adults. However, they have to be receptive to mental health. And I like the, uh, the young lady said before me, it's been taboo in our community, but we're seeing some great efforts as we do different things to try to to try to uh, well, I, what I like to say, make chocolate a little bit of the mental health situations because our people think mental health you're just crazy and you're not crazy. Some things we need to get out and some traumas we need to talk about, and I just wanted to be the conduit to get people to start exploring those conversations. Thank you for that. CJ, I watched you out in the community in places that most people won't go. And I remember seeing you up on Southern Avenue. There was so much despair and pain because of senseless killing. And when you spoke to everyone, including myself, your message of hope and your message that there's a brighter side and you talked in a way that people could feel and understand what you were saying. How do you maintain that kind of uplifting commitment to transforming negative situations among our young people? Because I once was that young person, I believe in hope. And and the scripture says, I hope that is seen. It ain't really hope at all for what a man see what do he hope for, for what he don't see. And he remains at hope. That truly is hope. So for me, you know, in our conditions, in our neighborhoods, there's a lot of uh, hopelessness. People don't believe they can be more than what they are. They don't believe that they can get out of the conditions that they are. What I wanted to be was the example because I come from a broken home. My father was murdered when I was eight years old. I actually jumped on the corner to get my mother off of corner. I've been incarcerated on the fourth floor of jail while my mother was on the third floor of jail. But regardless of where you come from, regardless of your neighborhood, regardless of your background or your family, one change in thinking and positive self-speech and begin to forecasting and seeing your life outside of the neighborhood and your past failures, at that point in time, you can become that which you never thought you could be. I'm living. Yes, You're sir. a living example of that. We're going to drop the mic with that one, brother, because sure. I appreciate sure. you stay strong and continue to be that light. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yes, indeed. And thanks for joining us. My sincere thanks to my guests on this inaugural episode, President of Luminous Doctors Community Medical Center, Deneen Richmond, and founder of Saving Ourselves, C.J. Blair. I am Calvin Hawkins, County Council Chair, the host of the People's Movement, a production of the Prince George's County Council. Again, thank you for viewing this episode. Take care, stay safe, and see you soon.